Cody, it's time to get off the watch. Uh, good morning, team. It's uh, great to be with you here uh, on day three. It feels like about day ten uh, of what has been a, a frenetic couple of days. And I'd certainly like to uh, have a shout out to all our, of our visiting international uh, friends. Uh, it's wonderful to have you with us, uh, not just to show you really cool videos about our Navy, uh, but also to draw upon your great experience as our friends, partners and allies in this region. Uh, we're all here for a commonality of purpose. You know the theme of Sea Power 2022 very, very well. And uh, you all know me well enough to know that while I think our submarines, our planes and our ships are really, really cool, the thing that matters to me the most is you guys. This is your Navy. You are our capability. And getting you together today for this Sailors Forum is, is absolutely uh, about sharing ideas, listening uh, and implementing uh, what you want from your Navy as we move forward. Uh, we're on the uh, precipice of a very important uh, time in our Navy as we grow from being a, a small to medium-sized power to a, a, an internationally recognised medium-sized Navy. We know that we've got cutting-edge technology, we've got some of the greatest capabilities in the world, and they are the greatest capabilities in the world because of you. You bring them to life, you operate them, and if we, if we need to fight them, you will be the ones that take us to sea and fight and win. So uh, I, uh, I really, really am delighted to have so many of our senior sailors, our junior sailors, and our future sailors involved in Sea Power 2022. Uh, please get involved. Don't hold back. Bring forward your thoughts uh, because there's no such thing as a silly question or a bad idea. 
and I, uh, I'm really, really delighted to be your chief. Um, the sad thing is, I'll go soon. <laughs> and have to leave you to um, move forward. But be in no doubt uh, that I'm very, very proud of what we've achieved as a Navy together um, over many years. And I've had the privilege to serve at sea and ashore with many of you. And I do leave very proudly in July, knowing that our Navy, both now and into the future, is in great hands. Uh, I guess if I am to say that the Sailors Forum is officially open, it's open. But as far as I'm concerned, it was open on, uh, on Monday morning when many of us bumped in and started talking with our regional friends and partners. Uh, well done. Keep up the great work. And it's, a, it's been a pleasure to serve with each and every one of you. Thank you. Sir, so thank you for those kind words. And um, I just want to uh, pause for a moment and thank you for your service to our Navy. Um, on behalf of all our workforce, enlisted and officers, um, I've worked alongside you for the last two and a half years. It's been the most proudest moments of my life. So um, thank you for your service. Um, and you've left the Navy in a ship shape, but you've got a couple more things to do before you go. <laughs> all right. Um, I'd, I'd firstly like to welcome you in friendship and partnership but I'd like to also acknowledge the digital owners of the land in which we meet today, the Gulligal people, and in the Aurora Nation. We recognise our First Nations people, their continued connections to lands and waters, and we pray our respect to their elders past, present and emerging, and we thank veterans that have served or continue to serve from Indigenous heritage. Secondly, I'd just like to uh, draw everyone's attention, uh, the Australian team, um, to my, my international counterparts. I'm absolutely humbled uh, to host, um, on behalf of the Chief of Navy, um, 26 nations, and in no particular order, except it's alphabetical, I'd just like to thank these countries. Uh, Brunei, Canada, Chile, Fiji, France, India, Indonesia, Italy, Japan, Jordan, Malaysia, Maldives, Netherlands, New Zealand, Peru, Philippines, the Royal Marines from the UK, the Royal Navy, Singapore, Sri Lanka, Sweden, Tanzania, Thailand, UAE. From the USA, we have Pack Fleet and the US Coast Guard. I'd like to thank those gentlemen for coming all this way. Um, I'm absolutely honoured to share experiences with you um, and I look forward to our conference tomorrow. Um, for those that aren't... I started by saying that I welcome you in friendship and partnership, and that's absolutely what we're here to do. Um, the last two years, it's been quite difficult to get out um, and, and into the region, and, I, and all of you in the room have been out doing not co what we call contactless deployments. Um, Arunta was our first ship we got alongside in a traditional port visit outside the COVID restrictions, and I thank India, who's here, to, for the hospitality that you gave that team, and I look forward to getting our ships and our sailors into your ports uh, as often as, as much as we can, because without that human connection, without learning about culture, um, understanding the food, the experiences, the beautiful scenery, um, you can't understand each other and we can't work together as well. So I thank you all for coming. The Sea Power Conference will explore a broad theme, the Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain, the 21st century, commonality of purpose. We've pulled together a program today that starts with setting around what that commonality of purpose, what is the Indo-Pacific, um, and then we'll roll into some updates about the current fleet. And after lunch, I'm delighted that some of the international uh, counterparts will be able to give us some updates from their nations. And then the last session of today, we'll, talk, we'll hear from our people that are actually out, not, out doing stuff, not me sitting behind a desk in Canberra um, on a video screen that I've spoken to most of you on for the last two years. So I'm really excited about the day. Um, please come in and out. Um, please engage. And as the Chief said, please ask tough questions. So it's my great honour to introduce our first keynote um, address. It's Professor John Blackson. Uh, thank you for your time, sir. Um, you've always been a good friend to our workforce and I, I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Deb. Teramakasi, uh, salam pagi, bienvenidos, namaste. There are, there are a couple of ones I can think of at the moment, but it's really great to see a wonderful international contingent here. Um, 
uh, from around the world, across the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I'm honoured to be here for the keynote uh, of, the, of, the, of the session, being with the people who are the Navy and the navies of our neighbourhood, our friends and partners. This is where it's at, and the Chief of Navy is absolutely right, and I'm thrilled to be here, absolutely tickle pink. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope it's going to, I'm going to make it worth your while, but hold on to your seats because we're going to do what I'm calling a geostrategic SWOT analysis for Australia. And as you'll see from this map, it's, it starts with the map of Australia. It's a RAF, I'm sorry, it's RAF, not Navy, right? It's a RAF planning map centred on Darwin, but spun 45 degrees, right? And you get a sense, by doing that, you get a sense of Australia hanging off Asia. But you also get a sense of Australia in the Indo- one side, Pacific, the other. It's a no-brainer, isn't it, really, when you think about it like that. That's where we live. And, you know, Australia has had an issue with reconciling its history with its geography. We've kind of been this... Uh, we've culturally been somewhere in the mid-North Atlantic, but geographically we're not. We're in the Indo-Pacific, and we're slowly coming to reconcile our history with our geography, which is a bloody good thing, right? And it's so great that so many people from the Indo-Pacific are here, and I'm delighted that we're here for this. So let me continue. What I've got is, I've done this, a SWOT analysis, it's kind of, you know, it's a business concept where you look at the internal strengths and weaknesses and external opportunities and threats. Well, I've applied it geostrategically to Australia's circumstances. And when you think about it, and it's in that, uh, that paper there on the left, the centre of gravity paper, but essentially, we're dealing with a spectrum of global security challenges. It's not just economic, not just environmental, not just political and human, or but cyber, maritime, territorial and homeland. It's bigger than Ben-Hur, OK? And for those of you who don't know who Ben-Hur is, go and Google him because he's a really great guy, great movie, all right? Uh, some of the older folks you know and are chuckling along. The younger folks, look up the movie, it's a cracker, right? Um, <laughs> um, but this, the, the diagram here in the middle, the, it's my, it's, I'm a simple guy and I need pictures, right? So I was trying to distill this complexity into, into some apparent simplicity. And when you think about it, what we're dealing with is a spectrum of challenges, not just great power contestation. Yes, it's part of the equation. But it's not just the environment. It's not just what the Greens are saying. It's not just about looming environmental catastrophe. Yes, that's part of the equation. Oh, and there's also governance challenges, right? We're talking about the breakdown of law and order, terrorism, people smuggling, drug smuggling, corruption, etc. All of those things, when you combine them, that bit in the middle, now I'm giving you my bluff, my bottom line up front, because this is my so what from the SWAT, okay? But I'm giving it so you can see it when we go through it. But essentially, this is a complicated... Who owns that space? Navy? No. Army? No. Air Force? No. Defence? No. Home Affairs? No. Uh, DFAT? No. Who owns it? Is it, you know, is it a New South Wales jurisdiction thing? No. Is it a federal? No. Is it an international? Well, there's no international body dealing with it. Who the hell owns this problem? Well, we all do. Right. Okay, so let's go. Going to go through them now. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Going to race through them. Hold on to your seats. Yeah, the wind, at least the hot air from me, is going to rush past your ears, okay? Um, so hold on. Natural resources, the land of plenty, right? Eh? The lucky country, uh, uh, our land abounds with nature's gifts, beauty rich and rare, okay? Um, we've got lots of them. It's one of the great strengths of Australia and one of the reasons why we have such a strong economy, let's face it, you know? Uh, we mine the thing to, to kingdom come. Um, but it's in relative decline, not that we're doing badly, but our neighbours are doing better. They're outstripping us, out, outpacing us, okay? Then um, we've got domestic political stability and the rule of law, which we've kind of tended to take for granted a little bit, a bit like oxygen. You know, you don't you don't think about oxygen until you until you don't have it, and then all of a sudden you're screaming, looking out for it. Okay, and this is a bit like this, and we've seen this a little bit with the pandemic and the protests, and starting to see a little bit of fraying of the political and social order that we've taken for granted and that we can't afford to take for granted. Okay. And then we've got an educated workforce, and I'm at the Australian National University, Australia's, you know, very prestigious university, tickle pink to be there, I have to say, it's a wonderful place to be. But um, we, we, are, we are an educated workforce, you are amongst the most educated navies in the world, right? You, are, you have a training system that is world class, um, and you are the beneficiaries of it, and 
part of the problem for the Navy is keeping you because you're so employable elsewhere, right? Um, you've got so many great skills that are incredibly marketable. I just hope that you also ha have a sense of patriotic duty that you'll hang around a bit longer and that in the meantime, the Chief and Navy can boost your conditions of service to make it all that more attractive to stay and maybe you recruit some of your friends along the way. Um, we've got a multicultural society. 55 years ago, we abandoned the white Australia policy. All right? 55 years ago, we went by, from being white bread to being much more cosmopolitan, much more mixed. We've got now, you know, 4% of our population from Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia and South Asia, let alone from Latin America, Africa and the rest of Europe. It's really much more diverse than it ever was. Quite extraordinary. We've got a honed and high-tech defence force, but it's a boutique one, OK? And you guys are part of it. And the Chief, the Chief of Navy talked about this briefly, the fact that we need to grow the force. We, we have an ADF that can't sustain attritional con uh, in, uh, conflict in any kind of substantial manner. It's because we're a one-punch force. We're designed for the unipolar moment when the United States was top dog uncontested. And we were kind of saw ourselves as, you know, looking after our patch and helping out when we need to with others. Ladies and gentlemen, those days are no longer, OK? We have structured for a moment that has passed and we need to accelerate change. Uh, just in terms of the army, and I'm, I, I was in the army a long time ago, so humour me please, don't, don't, don't throw stones. Um, but in terms of the army, we have a one to two division force. Now in a division, it's about 10,000 troops, right? At the height of the Second World War, January 1943, out of a population of under 8 million, we mustered 14 divisions. We have one and a half today. We have a navy of a dozen warships and a handful of submarines. We've had that for about 50 years, right? And an air force of about 100 fighters and a few enabling aircraft. They're good, whoopee doo. In a serious stoush, that ain't going to touch the sides. And it's one of the reasons why we need collaboration, co cooperation and partnership. So the other th reason why we've got a boutique defence force is because we've got a bloody big moat, right? Um, and you guys are in key parts of defending the moat. Um, but essentially, we've, it's given us this kind of this kind of confidence that, hey, you know, she'll, she'll be right, mate. And no worries. Take it easy. You know? no, don't spend too much on defence, really. What, what the hell, you know? What's the point? Um, well, I think there are some points. Um, but we can leverage uh, also from our connections with the United States. I contributed to this book, Australia's American Alliance. Um, and uh, intelligence connections uh, and interoperability, that map in the top right, it's the, you know, the strategic essence, the suitable piece of real estate, the Joint Defence Facilities Pine Gap. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you at the unclassified level, that is freaking amazing, all right? What it delivers for Australia's defence, the insights it provides on threats, on ballistic missiles, on international developments, is worth every freaking penny, I'm telling you now, okay? Now, you won't get a, much more than that out of a security briefing, but it is really worthwhile, OK? And whenever a Prime Minister comes to office or a Defence Minister goes out there, gets briefed, he picks up his jaw and then he says, yeah, that's a good deal. Um, all right. So then we've got a series of weaknesses. We've got a complacency about our place in the world. You know, we've, got, we've had a revolving door of prime ministerships over the last 10 years or so, and really, who cares? I mean, Australia's been prosperous. Does it really matter if the economy's ticking along and everything's fine? Well, on one level, you'd think not, but I would contend that perhaps into the future that day is becoming more important than it's been, right? And then we've got infrastructure pressures, an uneven population distribution around the southeast corner uh, of only 26 million. We still can't get the infrastructure bits quite right. Um, and then we've got a dependency on international service providers, a GPS systems that we are more and more dependent on than ever. We had don't control uh, cable communications cables that are more vulnerable than we realise. Remembering that the First and Second World War, one of the first things Great Britain did at the start of the First and Second World War is what, ladies and gentlemen? Anyone like to guess? Cut the cables. Cut the cables. The under, undersea cables got cut, and we are more dependent on them than ever, let alone on refined oil, which, thanks to our Singaporean and Korean friends, we, they do most of the refining for us. But let me just say, ladies and gentlemen, I can, you know, what could possibly go wrong? Well, love the Singapore, love Singaporeans, but there are half a dozen plausible man-made or, or natural disasters that could interrupt that flow, right? And... Uh, 
what are we doing about it? Oh, she'll be right, mate. It's okay. No, don't worry about it. Well, I think we should. Um, then we've got power vulnerabilities. So we use, we're getting more hydro. Um, we've got lots of solar. We're getting more solar. We export uranium. We don't take it back and we don't use it. We're a bunch of nimbies. Not in my backyard, thank you very much. Right? So even though we're on the most stable continent, on the most least populated continent on the planet, we won't take it back and we won't use it. Oh, I can't figure that out. That's just got me bamboozled. I don't get that. Anyway, I'm not a scientist. I'm just an opinionated boob. But there you go. Um, cyber vulnerabilities. We've gone from being web-enabled to web-dependent, and in the process we've become web-vulnerable. So we are more vulnerable now from, from afar than we've been arguably ever. And so you see the emergence of this, uh, uh, this development uh, of, uh, uh, of the Australian Cyber Security Centre and the ASD, Australian Signals Directorate, getting resourced because we've got to compensate for the vulnerabilities, OK? Um, and we've got limited sovereign capacity to respond to crises or war. We haven't felt the need to have much of a defence industry in Australia. Why? Because we just buy it off the shelf from someone else, right? Um, and, well, of course, what, what could possibly go wrong? And if what the U war in Ukraine is showing, if anything, it's that supplies of critical munitions, uh, when you want them, chances are everyone else is going to want them too. So we're having to rethink how we prioritise the supply and the provision and development of those capabilities because, you know, it's always, at, you know, in the army we used to talk about things happening at the corner of four maps. Uh, at night, it's getting dark, it's starting to rain and your battery's dying. Right? That's when it happens. Um, it's right where you don't want it to happen, that's where it's going to probably happen. Um, and of course, we're not prepared for that, we're not resilient. Um, then, okay, opportunities. Now, I've grouped these, I've grouped these uh, geographically. <clears throat> and the first one, South Pacific. Now, wonderful opportunities, but look at this map, folks. When you normally look at a map of the South Pacific, all you do is see specs, right? But when you add the exclusive economic zones, of these micro states of the Pacific, all of a sudden you get the geostrategic economic significance jumps out at you. Of course it does. Incredible, lucrative fisheries, let alone seabed mining opportunities that emerge in this space for those countries like China that have signed up to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea back in 1982. But when you look at the edge, you look at the map, China's got a tiny exclusive economic zone. So, of course, they're going to be interested in exploiting the opportunities in the Pacific if countries in the Pacific let them. That's un a completely understandable impulse for them to want to do. I would contend it's not in our interests to let that happen, OK? And we need to work collaboratively to mitigate the risks and the effects of that happening. Um, but there are enormous opportunities here, and there's a lot we can do, a lot, lots to do in this, in this space. Um, ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, we have disaggregated this in our consciousness. And yet when you pull it together, it is a proto-great power. All right? we have, if you look at the stats, the charts, you see India, Japan, China, uh, maybe Indonesia, and then all the list micro-states, right? When you aggregate Southeast Asia, it's up there with India in terms of economic heft, in terms of population size, in terms of significance. And yet we literally and metaphorically skip over it on our way somewhere else, now, especially the RAF. You don't need to fly over it. You, know? you guys tend to go through it a lot more. But the other Army, Navy, uh, Army Air Force, sorry, defence, diplomacy, we go elsewhere. We're more comfortable in New York and Geneva uh, you know, than our own neighbourhood. And this is what I'm saying about reconciling our history with our geography. We live where we live. We've got to make that work for us. We've got to understand our neighbourhood. We've got to recognise our space. Um, so about a million prior to the pandemic, about a million visitors a year, about nearly a million people uh, living here with their Southeast Asian heritage, two and a half trillion economy, our third largest trading partner for crying out loud. Who knew? Who knew? Right? Well, no one does, because it's disaggregated. We completely don't think of it this way. But it's our immediate neighbour, right? This isn't some faraway country on the other side of the planet. This is our immediate neighbour. Then there's Northeast Asia. Now, we're more comfortable with this. We understand this one. Japan, Korea, China, Taiwan. This is a space where we do a lot of business with and have for a long time, and we've reaped the dividends of it, right? Um, 
Now, we're not seeing that so much because of the more illiberal assertiveness of China, making it more tricky. You know, back in the old days, you used to get one handler, one interpreter, you do a lap of China, sign up a few trade deals, come back in time for tea and scones, right? Well, not so anymore. It's a lot harder. Uh, but we have a whole range of other opportunities still. Max Such last year in the Australian Financial Review talked about, in over three articles, lambasted the government for how things were going. Um, talked about how badly we were handled things. But in the final paragraph, he says, yet outside the rhetoric, it's hard to see how Australia should have managed it differently. Different rhetoric wouldn't have produced a different outcome. The chief obstacle is the aggressive attempt to expand Xi's authoritarianism into the Indo-Pacific. No kidding. Right. So opportunities. Indian Ocean uh, uh, with the Quad, with the Indian Ocean Rim Association. And it's great to see nations from the Indian Ocean Rim uh, engaged with us today. Uh, very significant opportunities in this space as well. Um, with the rest of the world, very interesting to see the NATO countries playing in a way that they weren't a, a decade or two ago. Very interested in engaging in our space. France, of course, has enduring presence in our neighbourhood. We've got to re re recover that relationship. We've got to make that one work through France and through Croix du Sud, uh, through through activities, because they're there in the Pacific. They're not going away. We need to collaborate with them. Uh, of course, Canada, it's a Pacific power as well. Um, and I see we've got Canadians here, so that's great to see. Canada has a, a long history in the Pacific. They, they fought in, in, in Hong Kong in the Second World War and in the Aleutians uh, and in, in da Darwin, actually. They had a signals intelligence unit in Darwin in the Second World War. Um, France, Germany, you know, these countries have sent out warships. You guys have been working with them, I'm sure, in the last little while. The Brits back with a vengeance, obviously signing deals with us. FPDA, Five Power Defence Arrangement, 50 years old last year. I mean, it's extraordinary how this organisation that seems to be an anachronism still has legs, right? Um, now, it's problematic for, for Indonesia, of course, because it was set up against them initially, but it's no longer about like, Indonesia. Um, so we've got to find a way of actually making that relationship work better. AUKUS, a bit controversial, but of course when you think about it, it's actually a no-brainer. Um, conventional diesel sub, uh, electric subs, problematic because of the ability, increasing ability of potential adversaries to detect. If you start snorkelling with AI, satellites, uh, drones, etc., very hard to hide. With the increased stealth, the increased range, increased speed, you compensate for that. The key advantage of the submarine is not only range but stealth. And getting more stealthy is critical, so I'm all for it. All right, and I'm happy to talk about it in Q&A if we've got time later. The United States. This is a graph of a project I did with a colleague looking at how Thailand views the United States and other great powers. And if you see the red line and the blue line, the red line's China, the blue line's the United States. You see United States influence has not gone away, but it's eclipsed, right? And Australia has a very important role to play uh, uh, in, 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 in the demonstration effect. What we say and do has a demonstration effect in our neighbourhood. Right, Antarctica. Who knew that we had a land border with New Zealand, with Norway, with France, with Chile, with Argentina, and with Britain? Who knew? Right? Well, we do, ladies and gentlemen. And if in 50 years' time that place melts and turns green, and Australia turns brown, black, and crisp, that's going to be more important for our grandkids than you and I have ever conceived of. We need to reimagine the way we approach Antarctica. And then there's the threats. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I hope this is not going to induce a warm bath and razor blades, but this is a bloody long list, OK? Um, 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 so foreign interference. When I started writing about the history of ASIO a decade ago, ASIO was very comfortable with us talking about this anachronistic concept of foreign interference. By 2015, when we were finishing up the project, they said, oh, look, can you edit out some of those bits? We're not very comfortable with you talking about our MO, right? Ooh, um, it's back on. Game's back on, right? And then there's uh, cyber attack, and you guys know all about that. We've got um, the vulnerability. I talked about cables in the First World War. Guess what? Just as easy to cut today, OK? We're more dependent on them than ever, OK? Um, and you think about the space, it's a multifaceted, multidimensional space. Most of us think of the surface web, but there's deep and there's dark, and I don't, need, I don't have time to go into it today. But it's multifaceted, right? Eh? And you think about the implications for the domains of warfare. We used to think about sea, uh, sea and land. Then aircraft came along the First World War. V-2 rockets in, at the end of World War II started out the space domain. We've gone human, and we've, got, we've always had human, but we've gone cyber as well. It's very complicated space. It is multifaceted. 
And then we've seen the US transactional retreat from ideational leadership under President Trump. Uh, we've seen some retreat from that, but not that much. We've got a religiously and politically motivated violence at home and abroad. Marawi, uh, bombings in Bali, Jakarta, uh, problems in the streets of Melbourne, in, in Martin Place, uh, and, and so on. Okay? The, no, we don't know what the future holds, but this is a real challenge for the future. Then we've got good old-fashioned conventional or nuclear war. You know, Bring back the good old days where we knew the goodies were and the baddies were, I say. Okay, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. But there is the prospect of war, and it is close, over the Korean Peninsula, the East China Sea, what China calls the Diaoyu, Japan calls the Senkaku Islands, over the Taiwan Straits and over the South China Sea. What could possibly go wrong? You know, Lots, obviously. Um, and uh, Linda Jakobsen writes, what does China want? I don't think outright war with China uh, is likely, she says, and I agree. China will use means all, all means short of war to get what it wants, um, and using a mixture of tactics of intimidation, disinformation and cyber attacks, leaving uh, the United States and allies like Australia hard-pressed to counter these moves. They refuse to present a nail, right? What's the freaking use of having that hammer? Well, it's still good having a hammer, because a nail, nail may yet present itself, but it's not the only factor, okay? It's not the only part of the equation. Then there's, of course, increased environmental challenges, climate change, extreme weather, uh, food security, etc. cetera. Um, and we've seen this. You guys have lived it. I don't need to tell you about it. And then there's transnational security concerns, a long list uh, which you can quickly skim there, right? And then there's and the, and the people smuggling, drug smuggling through the Pacific from Latin America and Southeast Asia. It's into the streets of Melbourne and Sydney. Then we've got large-scale unregulated people movement. We saw Rohingyas get on boats uh, not that long ago. There's a prospect of Malaysia, uh, of Myanmar, sorry, melting down and presenting a problem bigger than Bangladesh can handle. Uh, we've got watch this space. Then our relationship with Indonesia. We've played a game of snakes and ladders there, uh, up and down, you know, up the the snake and then down with beef boat spies, Clemency Timor, Papua Jerusalem. We have fumbled that relationship. We do not respect them enough. We need to play that differently. Then there's Southwest Pacific fisheries challenges, and we touched on this when we were talking about opportunities. And then there's diminished biodiversity and pandemics. So, where to here? We've got a long list there, folks. That's my distillation. We started that at the outset. We've got a big problem. Navy's part of the solution. It's not the entirety of the solution, but we need to work collaboratively with our partner nations and partner agencies domestically and internationally. We've got a foreign policy plan B, 2017 foreign policy white paper, which basically articulated what happens when the United States goes in, introspective, okay? And it basically stresses everything else. Uh, the US engagement, yes, the Indo-Pacific, the Quad, the ASEAN relationship, the special summit, the Pacific step up, um, and regional economic and trade ties bolstered. But what we face, ladies and gentlemen, is not just the prospect of consecutive crises like we've been able to handle off the line of march, if you like, in an army sense, just from what you've got in, in stock, what's on the shelf, what's, in, what's at the heart, what's in, at, by the pier. But what might happen is if these happen uh, consecutively, uh, concurrently, sorry, at the same time, we face a crisis we're not prepared for. We are not ready to handle these things happening at the same time. And we need to brace ourselves for that happening. To do that, I think we need a plan B, a political and societal reawakening covering the environment, contestation governance. I think we need to establish a National Institute of Net Assessment to think about 50 years out, to think about what we do for our grandkids' sake. Um, uh, I think we need to strike a grand compact with the Pacific, uh, bigger than the Pacific step up, but akin to what New Zealand's done with Tonga and, uh, and Nui, uh, with uh, Cook Islands and Nui, sorry, uh, but in a collegial collaborative way, where we mutually respect each other and we work to build each other's capabilities. Uh, and deepen trade and security ties, reimagine engagement over Antarctic, Antarctica, and bolster endurance and resilience through an Australian universal scheme for national and community service. Incentivised but voluntary service for the nation. Um, there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. I've run out of time. Thank you for humouring me. Um, and uh, I hope that sparked some uh, interest and some questions, and um, hopefully there's an opportunity for that a bit later. Thanks very much, Deb. Thanks, John. Um, and uh, John, are you able to join us for questions? Yeah. Excellent. Um, 
I might get you to come up here, John. The only reason I say that, and please, team, bear with me with the mic. Um, we're actually live streaming this event today, and we're also going to have it recorded and have it on YouTube so you can have a look at it or get your shipmates to have a look at it. So we do need the questions through the mic. Um, I'm a big fan of Voice Primary, as you all know, but um, Voice Primary won't help us today. Um, so please, questions from the floor. Um, and there's, there's two very competent microphone carriers. Um, Thank you, Joel and Cheryl, for helping us out. Um, so please, who would like to ask the first question? There's one over here. Yeah, g'day, ma'am. G'day, sir. Ron Officer Dixon. Um, you mentioned the cables, and I saw your diagram of the cables. Now obviously we're an island nation so we can be isolated but I noticed there was a lot of cables going to China. So there's a two way street there or will we have the ability of the same impact that it would have on their nation as that would with us if those cables were cut? Yeah, thanks very much Mark. Mark, I actually owe Mark a lot. We work together. Um, he was my uh, warrant officer when I was the defence attaché in Thailand, and so he actually made me look good. Um, so I, I'm, I'm indebted to you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for the question. Yeah, no, it is a two-edged sword. It, all of these things are. They're double-edged swords. Um, uh, I would put to you, though, that uh, other countries have been giving this a lot more attention than we have, and they've been prepared to take risks that we have not been prepared to contemplate, uh, and that we need to revisit our history, uh, revisit... Uh, just what you have to be prepared to do in extremis um, if you want to be prepared to do, uh, defend your interests and to deter. And to my mind, it was very interesting, the Chief of Navy's video at the start, deter, detect, respond, deter. Critical to the, what we do in peacetime. It's about actually avoiding war. We don't want war. War is awful. It's ugly. It's destructive. Um, but what we want is the... The, the security and stability from a robust force able to respond to whatever challenges emerge, be it cable cutting or missiles or hypersonics or stealthy submarines. Thanks, Mark. Just whilst some people think of questions, I might throw one at you, John, if I may. Um, as background, I first met Pref Professor Blaxland when he was an ANU professor and I was a struggling student at the... the um, Command and Staff course. Legendary so, student, by the way. <laughs> so, um, Amazing. So from a simple sailor's mind, um, John, what advice have you got to the sailors in the, work, in, the, in the room about how they can better understand and better just quickly upload information to themselves? Is there a, is there a really easy resource that they could go to? Uh, no, that's a good question. Um, and... Uh, Look, there's so many easy resources now. The question is, what, where do you go? What do you pick? Um, and um, I think it's, you know, it's easy enough to... Uh, in my case, I, I, I follow a lot of uh, news sources. I read a lot of journals. And I'm reading a lot of books and trying to be across a range of issues. Um, I think, uh, you know, you're best to pick... In, what I do is I pick a, a couple of sources and, and there's... So I pick across the spectrum, so I go... Um, I, I read The Australian, I read The Canberra Times, I read um, The Guardian, I read Crikey, uh, I read um, The Conversation, and I, and I actually contribute, I write for all of those, really, on and off, occasionally. Um, but, you know, you, you're hard-pressed to go past the ABC website, to be honest, that's pretty good. Uh, and ch the Channel 9 ones are good, too, you know, there's... Pick one and follow it, and then when you find something controversial, then check it. But don't just swallow what you're reading first time. Always, if there's something that looks odd, chances are it is odd, uh, and double check. Uh, what I teach, I teach a course called Honeypots and Overcoats, Australian Intelligence in the World. And one of the key things I tell the students is check the source. Check, corroborate, right? Look for corroboration. How accurate and how reliable is the source? So they're the two judgments, and it's from the old-fashioned Admiralty rating scale, right? that the Royal Navy developed a long, long time ago, but it's still very, very applicable. How accurate and how reliable is that report you're reading? So what's the source? And often it'll be, quite often if you see something, it may be just be a copy from some other news source. So check the source, check the footnotes, check the, you know, where is it from, um, check the byline, and then look, if it is controversial, look to corroborate it. You know, check, check to see if there's another source out there that speaks to 
to that story. Because quite often, and in this day and age, we are dealing with a lot of misinformation and disinformation. Misinformation is just not accurate stuff. Disinformation is accurate, actively trying to mislead, okay? And there's a lot of that out there at the moment. So judicious uh, reflection on what you're reading. Uh, uh, I just noticed we've got a Singaporean uh, officer here in front of me. Uh, Straits Times good too. Uh, I, my Channel News Asia is also pretty good too. Uh, and I, I use that, I, I comment on it occasionally as well. Um, so that's probably a long-winded answer, but hopefully not too bad. Thanks, Deb. No, thanks. Uh, I think we've got a question in the middle of the room there. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thanks for uh, your presentation, John. Um, Lieutenant Ben Hoffman, currently posted to Fleet Legal. You mentioned uh, or suggest that uh, Australia should consider re-engagement uh, in the Antarctic region. Mm. How do you envisage that playing out before 2048 uh, and then potentially after that timeline? Yeah, so we've got a very light footprint in Antarctica. We've talked about building a runway. We backed off, I don't think we should have. Uh, we've got one ship that can go down there. I think we should have multiples. I think our presence should be much more substantial um, and we should not take the Chinese presence for granted. It is there. Uh, it is. They are pushing the bounds in terms of what... They're trying to set precedents for what's acceptable uh, by pushing the terms and uh, seeking to establish precedents that will give them a, a stronger position, bargaining position into the future. And, and what we have at the moment, I, in my opinion, is we've got people engaged on Antarctic studies that are, tend to be scientists not and some lawyers, but they're not strategists. Uh, they're not people who've got a hard-nosed real politic calculation of what is actually transpiring. And we need all three. Um, you know, and environmentalists, of course. But scientists, essentially, is what I'm talking about. Scientists, lawyers and strategists. Yeah, thanks. We've got a couple of questions over here. We might go to the further back one, please. Thanks. Thanks, Leader. Uh, good morning, sir. Just a quick question. You mentioned that we need a political and society uh, wake up. Mm. Noting that in the past we have seen a fall off of Australia's industrial military complex and now rebuild, uh, how do we ensure that we don't have that fall off yet again in, as you say, 50 years down the track? Yeah, thank you. So uh, it's heartening to see at the moment, um, and it's you know in the conference floor next door, uh, quite a lot of small to medium enterprises, Australian enterprises being represented. And I've been to a couple of these kind of shows before, an Army one and an Air Force one, and it's been really great to see a fresh investment in those uh, in, you know, locally developed ideas because there's a lot of good ideas around there. Uh, and there's some great work that the what they call the primes are doing as well. Uh, so it's a fine balance between working with the primes, collaborating with them, and capitalising on the the great you know the industrial strength of the allies and the in, in, in technological edge that they've got, and the innovation and uh, nous and uh, flexibility of the homegrown Australian small to medium enterprises. So hopefully, I mean, this is really about government policy setting the right framework for that to happen. And, uh, and hopefully that's something we can see happen with a degree of consistency that's been lacking in the last 20 years. Yeah, thank you. And I think we had a question from another John, please. Good morning, John. John Blackstone from HMAS Penguin. This is a little bit of a long-winded question, but it relates to your comments about uh, the introspection of the American government and the previous president, plus our complacency of our leadership at the moment. How do we and the think tanks encourage the government to get over this complacency and actually be more engaging, considering that we've had many unexpected surprises in the last six or seven years, including the election of Trump. There is the possibility he could be re-elected again. So these are unexpected things that we really didn't plan for. Yeah, no, thank you. So um, I think part of it is actually happening gradually. Um, and one of the reasons why I'm delighted to speak to the geostrategic SWOT analysis this is with you this morning is because of the advocacy work I'm doing in trying to raise awareness of the, the fact that what we're facing is not what we faced before. It is a much more complicated problem. It's a multi, much more multifaceted problem and it's a much more long, long standing uh, challenge. It's not just about the next electoral cycle. It's not just about the 24 seven news cycle. It's about the prospects intergenerationally for where we position ourselves for the future. 
reconciling, as I talked about before, our history with our geography. And, and our people, it's very interesting the kind of where we go on this discussion. Um, you get people lambasting AUKUS and the Quad and, uh, and Australia's connection with the Five Eyes. You know, look, let's be real here, folks. We are part of the Anglosphere. You can't pretend we're not. To say that you're not part of the Anglosphere is just to not deny your DNA. It's ridiculous. We, we are who we are, but we are also we are where we are. And with the change, of, as I mentioned, with Australia since the White Australia policy was abandoned 55 years ago, we are a more multicultural society. We are more inviting of people from Southeast Asia and the Pacific into our, into our society. Uh, and it's great to see, you know, and I've increasingly seen this, even at the tail end of my service, I was seeing people from Southeast Asia and the Pacific who were in uniform working alongside me and my colleagues. Really great to see, and uh, hopefully more of that is going to come. But that is, I think, the, the way of the future. We need to be thinking about how we, you know, not try and do one or the other. It's not a binary. It's actually a fusion. It's about recognising the strengths of our Anglo-European roots um, and of which, which is actually one of the things that attracts many students. So at the ANU, we have thousands of students from Southeast Asia, South Asia and, and East Asia come to study at ANU. Why? What is it? Well, it's partly because we teach in English, uh, but also because it's rigorous um, and it's, it's world class. Um, and that's not to be sneezed at. So we don't want, we don't want to dilute that. That is actually a strength. That is one of the most attractive features of Australia, I would contend. But along with that is a recognition and a respect for the cultures, for the contributions of minorities in, a, in and amongst us from Southeast Asia and beyond and from the Pacific and beyond. Um, and I think that's the way of the future. And hopefully we've got um, a r increased recognition in our political class that that's the way it's got to be. We can't just play the short-term political gamesmanship Thanks. I think we had a question over here, please. Yeah, g'day, John. Uh, Guy Blackburn, good to see you last night at the Coral Sea commemoration as well. Thank you. Um, thanks for the analysis. Um, I'm the Navy workforce planner, or I'm, I'm one of them. Mm. Uh, and I've listened to a lot of the plenaries, and what it comes down to is people. Yep. Um, we can have all the technology in the world, but if we haven't got smart people, then it's going to make it very difficult. Um, and defence can't be in a contest with industry for smart people because we can't win because of the the legislative um, boundaries that we've got around it. Yep. I'm going to challenge one of your strengths up there where you said we've got an educated population. Yep. Um, we've slipped in OECD rankings for education yep. um, and what we're seeing is an increasing requirement of STEM and less uh, engagement in STEM discipline. Um, there are other countries in the region that are represented here like Singapore that have invested heavily in education. Yep. What, what do you think we need to do um, to turn education more into a strength um, so that we don't get into that competition uh, with industry where, quite frankly, we won't win? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, I, look, I think there's been interesting during the political campaigning of the last few weeks some talk about education and recognition of some of the limitations of where we've gone. We've been pouring a lot of money into education, but our ranking hasn't gone up. It's been in buildings and kind of soft, soft programs that are not foundational. And that's, I think, increasingly a recognition that you do actually need foundational skills to be better resourced, but also championed better. Uh, we have not been, I think, you know, and I'm, I'm, look, this is edges of my, I don't claim to be an expert in this area, but in my anecdotal sense of what's going on, being in the, in the, in the, in the ivory tower, if you like, in academia, is that um, we have not valued enough uh, science and maths teachers. We have not uh, re remunerated them appropriately and we've not made the job attractive enough. So we actually have problems uh, in schools where, uh, you know, we've tried to empower the students, but in empowering the students, we've actually disempowered the teachers. And that's, I think, generated all sorts of educational and ed disciplinary problems in schools that is actually uh, counterintuitively quite harmful. I think. So we have a number of problems there that need to be addressed. But just on the, can I go to the workforce planning stuff? And I touched on OSNEX, and I've got a piece coming out in Policy Forum today with the Crawford School at ANU, a, a blog piece on uh, what I'm calling OSNEX, the Australian Universal Scheme for National and Community Service. So what we've seen over the last couple of years with the fires and the, 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 the floods, the plagues, the pandemics and so on, is that the tempo and the scale, the severity of these challenges seems to be on the increase. 
and the volunteer ethos of the Rural Fire Service and the SES, uh, uh, which has served us well so far, I think is not going to serve us well into the future. And that's why I think we need to actually double down on a scheme. Now, every, and I, I talked to actually uh, the Chief, Chief of Navy a little while ago when I first came up with this idea, and he said to me quite rightly, John, I don't need that many extra sailors, I just need a few more. Um, and I, and I, I would contend, look, I think we do need more than just a few more if we need, because we need to get out of the mindset of just a, a middle power uh, Navy for the unipolar moment. We need a, a more muscular, quantitatively and qualitatively improved Navy um, and, and, and Defence Force writ large, SES and RFS and police as well. The thing, all of these things need more. Right, we've got underemployment at the moment. We've got a lot of people who've been on on uh, on a variety of government schemes. I, I think we should be looking to provide an incentivised but voluntary scheme where you where you give re reward and recognition. So you remunerate, you provide in incentives for soft loans for business or concessions on higher education for people to do one or two years in a ready reserve like scheme. Okay, where we bolster our numbers. Now, people have said, oh, John, that's too hard to manage, it's kind of problematic. Look, um, we, we can't sit still. We have to change. We have to grow. Um, we, and we have the resources. We have the way, ways to do it. We just need the political will to implement this program. Now, there's pushback because of the legacy of conscription in the Vietnam War era. It's politically contentious, which is why I'm suggesting we need an incentivised voluntary scheme. So make it so that it's kind of an expectation that when you finish school, you spend a couple of years in doing national and or community service. Uh, and we don't see it as an exception. And you people are exceptional people, but you're a small fraction of Australian society. This should be, you should be a bigger fraction of Australian society. And people say, oh, you know, John, this, we know very little uh, unemployment at the moment. Look, there's a lot of underemployment at the moment, I would contend. And if we need a, a visionary scheme, it's got to be bigger than the Navy. It's got to be led by the, the senior leadership of the government, which is why, I, look, I've hit, been hitting up both sides of politics with this idea. I'm hoping it will get traction and that it will trickle down with benefits to Navy, whereby you guys are uh, resourced better and you guys who are junior sailors are motivated to stay on uh, and you are recognised for the skills and the credentials that you are acquire, accrue while you're in service and that you have a contribution to make in service and beyond service. Thanks very much. Thanks, Guy. Uh, one over here, please. Thanks, sir. Uh, leading Tim and Beams from the School of Maritime Warfare. Um, I've just got a, I thought your SWOT analysis sorry, was excellent. Um, two things I got from that was uh, the environment and then also community spirit. If you sort of mentioned it just recently about, um, you know, like national like volunteering and all that kind of stuff, but yep. hypothetically, if the Defence Force is away on a deployment or there was a war, God forbid, um, do you think there would be need for a Home Guard to respond to disasters and national events? Do you think that would be a paid service outside, say, the SES? There's a lot of people here, you know, we've done the flood assist, bushfire assist. Do you think there'll be a need for a, a specialised department for that? So, yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, I think what there is is a need for a specialised instrumentality to coordinate state and federal government initiatives. The problem is that in a federation like Australia, you know, it's different to New Zealand. New Zealand's a unitary state with one house of parliament. Australia has a... In the federal government, we have a lower house and an upper house, House of Reps and the Senate, and then we have eight other governments, often with a lower and an upper house. Some not, some don't, like Queensland's just unicameral. But that's eight other premiers uh, and opposition leaders. It's eight other political systems to take into consideration when negotiating. It's bloody hard pulling it together. You know, so when you... I mean, I'm... I don't want to defend Scott Morrison here, but when you compare Jacinda Ardern to Scott Morrison, Scott Morrison's job is a lot harder. A lot harder. He's got two houses of parliament, which he barely controls, and he's got eight other centres of political power, all with monstrous egos. Okay? How do you manage that? Uh, very, very difficult. Um, so it, it is a challenge. Um, and uh, so I don't know if I've answered your question, but, I, but it, it's complicated. And, and I think what we need is... A instrumentality, I think, probably coordinated at the Prime Minister and Cabinet level, a national uh, and community service coordinator, 
to actually make sure that we come up with a plan so that the states are resourced. Part of the issue here is that the federal government has one lever it can pull, and that's the ADF, right? It, and it's a very obvious one. You pull the ADF lever, you get ADF people on the streets and you get news coverage, you're on the, you know, the headline news, right? Um, if you resource the state-based bodies, the state police, rural fire service, SES, AMBOs, et cetera, well, the federal government doesn't get much kudos out of that. So we've got to find a way that compensates for that felt absence or the felt need for political relevance there to make these bodies work. And I saw, my sense is let's not reinvent the wheel, let's not make it something new, let's have a coordinating body that then resources these properly. SES, RFS, um, National Parks and Wildlife on the off months, uh, uh, as I say, ambulance services, and then train people up in this space. Look, there's a lot of... I'm mindful also, there's a lot of veterans out there who are very skilled, not just in the Defence Force, but in these other agencies, who could be drawn back in to help mentor and coordinate and, and train in this space. We, but we do need to think imaginatively and we need to think big. Thanks. Yeah, that's a good point, John. And just for the room, um, Chief of Navy says quite often um, the New South Wales Police Force is just over 16,000 people and, as you know, we're just over 15,700. So when you put context around that, it makes us sound pretty small. So thank you for pointing that out. I think we've got a question over here, please. Good morning, Sir Lieutenant Casey from Patrol Boat Group Darwin. I just wanted to ask about your views on the human domain of warfare, in particular as social media and the part that will play in future. Uh, reflecting on the current war in Ukraine and how social media has played a role there. Um, do you think social media will be a strength or weakness in future? Uh, what are your views? Yeah, no, great question. Uh, look, social media is now part of the equation in a way that it wasn't when I went through my training and education. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an instrument of warfare. Um, it's part of the suite of information operations capabilities or psychological operations, if you like. And I mentioned in passing misinformation and disinformation. That's very much in that space as well. But as I say, it's a double-edged sword. Um, so I think we need, we need training in that space about managing our own presence because I think it is important to be there, to be monitoring and engaging in this space and not shying away from it. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit wary of the, kind of the government's current approach to kind of not allowing anybody to say anything. I think we need to be much more proactive rather than reactive. Um, and uh, that requires a, a different mindset to seeing information operations as not just peripheral and a kind of trimming on the side, but foundational. And as part, remember we talked about the domains of warfare briefly, uh, uh, land, air, sea, uh, space, and cyber, uh, and that cyber is an informational one in the human, the human cyber overlap is a is a informational domain that is actually now fundamental to victory. Uh, and and Vladimir, Vladimir Zelensky seems to get that, um, and um, we need to get that too. Uh, and certainly uh, the way it's been played out in the Pacific, the way things are happening in um, in, in, in places like Solomon Islands, it would suggest that we are, we're being outplayed. It's not just social media, but it is in that space too. Thank you. We'll just wait for the mic, please, Beck. Good morning, sir, and thank you for your insight on today's SWOT analysis. My question is, uh, with the recent uh, influence between China and the Solomon Islands. You mentioned that uh, New Zealand had actually uh, worked with uh, the Cook Islands and things like that yep. to strengthen their relationships within the Pacific. Yep. How do you see our relationships improving in the area and what can we take on the New Zealand take to strengthen these ties? Yeah, thank you. So uh, now whatever we might do in, in, in response in our neighbourhood, can't be a, just a carbon copy of what New Zealand's done with Cook Islands and Nui. It's not appropriate. Uh, the, in, the islands in the Pacific today are proud, independent nations. Um, uh, and so there's a lot we can learn from New Zealand and we, can, we need to respectfully and have a degree of humility in the way we approach this. But I think there's a lot to be said for collaborating, and this is the idea of the Grand Compact in the Pacific, which I've written about in a, a journal called Australian Foreign Affairs. But I've written in it in a piece just um, the other, recently in the, the Diplomat magazine, uh, 
calling it fear, honour and interests. It's playing off Thucydides, uh, you know, the great ancient Greek historian who talked about the Peloponnesian War. And fear, honour and interests were his kind of, he, his distillation of the causes of war, why people go to war, over fear, over on, sense of honour or dishonour and over interests, protecting their interests or exploiting their interests. Very interesting kind of distillation and I applied it to the Pacific and I, and I think what I tried to say there is that we need to see the space we're in as more about competition and contestation and potential conflict. So there's a spectrum of C's, competition, cooperation, collaboration, competition, contestation, conflict, all, all happening at the one time, okay? For the idea of the Grand Compact, uh, what I'm suggesting is that we respectfully engage with our neighbours and do them a deal. Now, it's got to be something that's an ideal that's attractive enough to the Australian electorate. It won't fly if our politicians don't think it will fly, right? So it's got to have a domestic Australian appeal. Um, and so the appeal is that for Australia, we would help manage the exclusive economic zones of these microstates and help with governance. We have in Australia a robust audit, inspector general, judicial oversight functions that enable our democracy to, rambunctious as it is, to muddle its way through. A lot of the smaller states in the Pacific are very small and they they don't have the same audit, inspector general and judicial separation of powers that are critical to a vibrant democracy that's under challenge from an authoritarian state, okay? And what we're seeing is that challenge presenting itself with uh, coercion, with financial manipulation, uh, with, um, uh, you know, bully boy behaviour and um, uh, underhanded actions. So what I'm suggesting is that what we need to do is make an offer to the Pacific Island states that is in their interests. So that what I'm suggesting is, hey, we, you, we, we, you, we form a, a, a compact of the Pacific, right? You get to be, you get to have residence rights and a path to citizenship in Australia and you get the privileges of being an Australian. Much like a Kiwi comes to Australia, gets the privileges of being an Australian, okay? You get the, all the benefits of being in Australia. Um, I think that's what we should be offering to the Pacific um, in exchange for the agreement to help with governance and the oversight of the EEZs of these places. So as a quid pro quo, we get a, we get a benefit because we get security and stability and, and a degree of uh, prevention of external influence um, and, and they get, as a result, a benefit of access, unfettered access to Australia uh, as, as equal rights. Now, for the micro-states, the very small ones, it's about a quarter of a million people, that's only fractionally over what we annually take intake uh, normally pre-pandemic. Now, we've had a couple of years of a hiatus and it wouldn't happen overnight. Uh, so I think this is something Australia can afford to do over a generation. And here's the reason. People say, oh, John, but that's, you know, you're being self-interested. Okay. No, I'm not. Um, it's a fact. It's got to be a factor. It's fear, honour, and interest. Okay, there's a fear here, a fear of climate change. If if climate change is real, if Tuvalu, Tonga, Kiribati, Solomon Islands, etc., are in fact vulnerable to sea storm surges and sea level rise, as seems to be happening, then we should be offering them a deal. If we are truly Vale, if we are family, we need to be offering them a deal, I would contend. And that deal, as I say, it has to be marketable politically, domestically in Australia too. And there's no, you get a lot of high-handed, you know, uh, kind of pontificating uh, people talking about, oh, Australia should be more generous. Look, you know, it's got to be politically feasible. You've got to be able to sell it to the Australian electorate, right? So that's why I say it's got to be a two-way street. And if you do that, um, then I think that's feasible and we're gonna, we've got a way forward. Thank you. Scott, please. Uh, Professor Scott Campbell, I'm just uh, interested and so first of all, thank you for the presentation. It it's, speaks to the why of what we do a lot. Mm. Uh, interested in um, so, so some guidance, inspiration into how the sailors uh, in the forum, when we conduct port visits, we do community engagement, we do all that sort of stuff. Why it's important um, to work with the partner nations at the sailor level and, and how 
we can turn those engagements into a strength for our nation? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Scott. Um, so I'm a great believer in defence diplomacy. Um, as a former defence attaché, I've seen the benefits of uh, an Australian uh, Anzac frigate come up the Chaparia River in Thailand um, and throw a cocktail party and have present an opportunity to engage with our counterparts and to uh, present uh, and demonstrate Australian goodwill, Australian capability, Australian presence, Australian commitment to the region. Very interesting with a country like Thailand. Um, it's not FPDA, it's not an immediate neighbour, and I, I like it, and Mark knows this well, um, I like looking at the Timor, ex uh, the, the Thailand example, because when we had a crisis in 1999, in a very difficult situation in our relationship with Indonesia, which we didn't start, it was a very complicated one, I could come back and give a talk on East Timor if you like, Deb, another time. But essentially, it was, you know, in, in, lots of people in Indonesia think it was our fault, it wasn't. Um, this as Prime Minister John Howard sent a letter suggesting a Matignon-like accord. Habibi, the president at the time, took was insulted, decided to have a plebiscite. He decided to have a plebiscite on whether Timor would become part of Indonesia or not. And it went ahead and it was disastrous for Indonesia. Right? So, but when that crisis came, we looked around the neighbourhood for a friend. Now, understandably, um, Malaysia and Singapore were reluctant to be the first to volunteer. They live right next door to Indonesia. Right? They were a little bit un un nervous about antagonising Indonesia. Completely understandable. Right? So uh, Air, Mar Air Vice Marshal Doug Riding, the Vice Chief of Defence Force, went on a tour. And he's, you know, FPDA, you'd think FPDA would be work, but for understandable reasons... Singapore and Malaysia were a little bit uncomfortable. So he went on to Thailand and the Thais thought, you know what, Australia is really a really significant regional partner. They were very instrumental in the Cambodian peace accord of 92, 93, and that helped turn, you know, what General Chawalit at the time called turning battlefields into marketplaces. That was a boon for Thailand, a boon for Cambodia, right? It was a win-win and that was Australia was instrumental with Japan and Indonesia in making that happen. Um, so the Thais sort of saw the crisis in 1999. They thought, you know what? We don't want Australia to fail. We'd, we, it's actually not good for that to happen. And they volunteered the Deputy Force Commander and then a task force of over 1,000 people to help. Now, thereafter, Singapore, Malaysia, Philippines, others quickly piled in on top, thankfully, but understandably didn't want to be first. Right? Now, I mention this because who thinks of Thailand as a key security partner? So it just doesn't feature in our consciousness very much. Great place to visit. Uh, but, you know, the king of Thailand went to Duntroon. Right? He, spent, he, he went, went through the Duntroon training group 10 years before I did. There are thousands of graduates of um, Australian courses at all, at all rank levels, uh, and, and there's an opportunity here for us to actually stretch this and... It'd uh, be interesting to hear your perspective, Mark, on, on making this something available for, for, for non-commissioned officers as well um, to expand our connections there. But that relationship, that investment over half a century generated remarkable effects. Who knew when we first started the Defence Cooperation Program in 1963 that we would be leaning on Thailand to help us in a crisis in 1999? No one was able to envisage that. But we invest in this space, in defence diplomacy, collaboratively with our neighbours in the Pacific and Southeast Asia, with this exactly kind of situation in mind. How do you manage a crisis? And let's not forget, East Timor could have been a freaking catastrophe for Indonesia and Australia. And it wasn't. And in part, that's because of defence cooperation and the defence relationship. It's also, to be fair, because of the great work of our defence attaches in Indonesia, who gave, had the foresight to get General Cosgrove to show respect to Marshal, Air Marshal Law Commander uh, Major General Kiki Shanakri. Um, that was a very significant move to show respect to the Indonesians as they handed over authority under the UN mandate for management of East Timor to Australia and the international force of East Timor. Right? very significant, that could have turned very ugly, but didn't because of deft handling, 
deft appreciation of the complexities and the cultural dimensions and the need to be respectful. Even though we, no one was happy, but to be respectful is really important. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, and um, John, thank you for the point about um, partnering and, and learning from other nations. Um, for those in the room, um, I'm honoured to meet tomorrow with my colleagues and one of the agenda items we'll have on that on the table is more opportunities for exchange and education and learning from, e from each other um, for our workforce. Um, we do a lot in the officer space and I think we'll all agree. Um, we can do more in the officer space but we need to do much, much more in the sailor space. So, so that is um, a, a subject for tomorrow. I just want to let everyone know. I think we're out of questions there, John. Um, oh, correction, we're not out of questions. My my UK friend is... <laughs> I thought we were friends, but apparently we're not. Sir, um, W1 Stephen, one officer to the Royal Navy. Um, fascinating update this morning, thought-provoking. I am a simple sailor, so I'll probably have more questions tomorrow once my head's been on a pillow. Um, you mentioned uh, NATO countries, you mentioned the United Kingdom. Clearly, last year during COVID, we, um, we sailed a task group into this area of the world, um, noting prior to the Ukrainian situation developing, the interest in this part of the world, particularly for my government, was growing. Um, just wanted your views on, your opinion on us sailing our task group, linking up with lots of fellow countries and partners, and, and bobbing around the oceans of this part of the world for a six to eight month period. Good, bad, indifferent? So I'm gonna uh, rail against the uh the consensus in academia, which was that it was a bit of a froth and bubble activity, I actually think it made a lot of sense. Um, it made a lot of sense on a number of levels. Um, it's contributed to uh, the bolstering of bilateral ties between the United uh, Kingdom and Japan. And it has contributed to a, look, I'll, my reading of it is that with uh, Brexit, the UK needed to uh, reburnish the special relationship with the United States. And one way to do that is to make itself more useful in the contest in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and so that's one dimension to it. One is also that you wanted to bolster trade ties with Japan and other countries in Asia. The, the Queen Elizabeth's visit um, was a very, very visible way of uh, pursuing that agenda. Um, and I think also it was a way of signalling to China that the UK would play uh, alongside its allies uh, and also signifying that NATO reaches. Now, this is, I think, something that shocks China. They forget that uh, two uh, Indo-Pacific powers, uh, Canada and the United States, are actually NATO countries, right? And they are Pacific powers too. But we don't think of NATO as having a Pacific remit. Um, and, of course, the UK, long-standing member of the FPDA, five-power defence arrangement with Malaysia, Singapore, Australia and New Zealand, um, has uh, legitimate interests in this space and I think it's very warmly welcomed. Uh, the, the current government um, has indicated as, as much and, as I say, I'm, I'm, I see why um, people think uh, of this as being not all that relevant, and people talk about comparing with the, uh, you know, the, the Prince of Wales and Repulse sunk in uh, December 1941 when they came to re rescue the Far Eastern Empire, um, and and the the failure of that, and they they draw a parallel, which I think is an unfair and unreasonable parallel. The world is a very different place today, um, and the significance of the carrier's visit is is demonstrably useful for British industry and for British engagement with the region and to bolster the position of other countries in the neighbourhood who are you know, kind of sitting on the fence about how much you support the US alliance, how much you support US presence in Asia and how much you just kowtow to Chinese pressure. Um, and as I said, with the demonstration effect for Australia, when we, when we speak and act, it provides an opportunity, I would contend, for neighbouring countries to act in a similar way, maybe just short, just shy of that level of forthrightness, perhaps, uh, and Britain's actions in, in coming to the Indo-Pacific demonstrate that. And it's very interesting to hear the, uh, the British government recently talk about uh, enduring and not letting Ukraine prevent it from continuing to play in the Indo-Pacific. There's a, you know, one of the great theorists, Mackinder, talked about... Um, control of the Eurasian landmass um, and 
uh, as being you know kind of the, the great determinant of the fate of great powers in the in the world. Now it's a little bit simplistic, but I think there is a truism to it. And Japan and J uh, the United Kingdom, two island nations, great island nations at either end of the Eurasian landmass, have a lot of notes to swap um, to, with each other. Um, and their actions, I think, have a really positive effect on a range of countries here. I'm thinking not just Australia, but Singapore, um, you know, Malaysia, uh, uh, Philippines, uh, and others in the neighbourhood who are you know, looking at how you, how you hedge your bets into the future. Uh, Britain playing its hand this way adds a degree of reassurance in the light of, you know, this uh, ideational retreat from, uh, the transactional retreat from ideational leadership by the United States kind of helps to balance the, the equation a little bit. And, and I'm, what I'm saying flies in the face of my colleague Hugh White, who, who's kind of of the view that we should basically let China have it. And I'm thinking, nah. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, I, th I think everyone will widely agree that um, the, this morning's presentation has been really helpful. Um, can you join me in thanking in the traditional way? John, I'd like to thank you um, and I'd like to present you some cufflinks and if you could possibly wear them with pride. Um, think of the enlisted workforce that um, have benefited from your point of view this morning. Really, thank you. Thank you, Deb. So, team, that brings us to the end of the first session. Um, just a couple of housekeeping points. Um, thank you, firstly, for all coming. Um, I sent an email to the Warren Osser Rank Group a couple of days ago and said, my biggest fear is no one will turn up. You build it and no one will come. Uh, and then I have to explain to the boss um, that I was a failure. So thank you for helping me out. But, but please don't make me a failure by not coming back. Um, deliberately, the next presentations are all shorter. Um, so I know it gets harder as the day goes on. Uh, the next session will be the fleet, the um, CWOs uh, from the various areas. Now, they've only been given seven minutes each. They have horse traded some time. I think CWO Naval Engineering sold some time to CWO Fleet. Um, so, but they've only got seven minutes and we can buzz them off a bit like the gong um, if they go over that time. And then, so that session will start at 11. And then the next session after that will start at 1300. Um, and that will be short, sharp, um, well articulated, far better articulated international counterparts of mine. And then the last session will be some really cool things that our people have been doing um, and hearing from our workforce about some of the challenges around Tonga, Flood Assist, Atomas Systems and Naval Mastery. Um, so please come back. Um, in between, go to the floor. Um, someone told me they got 28 stubby coolers yesterday in two hours. That's a pretty good gig. You've got two hours of breaks today, so if you can exceed that. Um, I haven't got a single stubby cooler, so if someone wants to grab me one, I'd be greatly appreciative. I need something to put my beer in. Um, but please, go and enjoy, and I'll see everyone back here at 11 o'clock, please. <laughs>